Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Imani Scott Blackwell here at Black Athenians. Arumi has trusted me again to do this, so I'm guessing it wasn't terrible the last time. So thank you for coming uh, or watching at home. We're going to be talking about the prison system, mass incarceration, and ultimately prison abolition. So I want to get started with uh, an introductory video, just kind of an overview on the prison system because that's not the main topic of the video. Uh, so I won't be going too into detail about how prisons function, what the history of them is, things like that. So we'll go ahead and start the video on that. In 2013, the number of Americans in prison, on probation, and on parole was 6.9 million people. That's the entire population of LA, Boston, Seattle, Miami, Atlanta, and San Francisco combined. And if you just look at people who are in prisons, it's just under 2.2 million people, which is just under the next two largest prison populations, China and Russia, combined. But that's just because the US is so big, right? Well, if this pile of people here represents the whole world, then the US is just under 5% of that. And if you take the world's prison population, the US has 25% of that. So if you look at the relative stats, for every 100,000 people, the US has around 700 people in jail. That makes the US only second behind Seychelles, a country with 90,000 people and a UN prison for Somali pirates. But has this always been the case? Well, if you look at the historical incarceration levels, they remain fairly steady until... the 80s. Please, please, one. The war on drugs. Open it. Drugs are menacing our society. They're killing our children. Since the 80s, the prison population has more than quadrupled. So what caused all of this? A national explosion of crime and illegal drug use led to the passing of two seminal crime laws. In the 80s, it was the mandatory minimum sentences for drug crimes, and in the 90s, it was the three strikes laws. They essentially forced a prison sentence on every drug offender in America over the last 30 years. The Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988 made crack the only drug that triggered a mandatory minimum sentence just for possession. Get caught with more than five grams, you're going to jail for at least five years. Get caught multiple times in a state with a three strikes law, you might be going to jail for life without parole. And because of these laws, we now imprison more people on federal drug charges alone than the total federal prison population in 1980. And so while crack fueled longer prison sentences, the drug that still leads to the most arrests? Marijuana. A drug that 42% of American teens and adults have tried once in their lifetime. From 2001 to 2010, more than 8.2 million people were arrested for marijuana. In 2014, the amount of people arrested just for marijuana possession was more than the number of people arrested on all violent crimes put together. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Imani Scott Blackwell, and I am here talking about the prison system, uh, mass incarceration, and the companies that are exploiting prison labor. Uh, I'm going to start off with a video kind of talking about the history of prisons and how they're functioning here now um, because I won't be focusing on that in the actual topic of the show. We're going to be going uh, a little bit further than that, so I just want to get uh, this out of the way for anyone that may or may not have prior information about this. So let's go ahead and cue our intro. To the beach, <laughs> Change the ways for the world or the government. If it was the president, then I would state facts. You leave it up to me, I'll paint the White House black and it can feature in your front. All right, so to go ahead and get started, I'm going to start off with that video that I was describing to you earlier. If we want to go ahead and pull that one up now, America has more prisoners than anyone else in the world. Period. In 2013, the number of Americans in prison, on probation, and on parole was 6.9 million people. That's the entire population of LA, Boston, Seattle, Miami, Atlanta, and San Francisco combined. And if you just look at people who are in prisons, it's just under 2.2 million people, which is just under the next two largest prison populations, China and Russia, combined. But that's just because the US is so big, right? Well, if this pile of people here represents the whole world, then the US is just under 5% of that. And if you take the world's prison population, the U.S. has 25% of that. So if you look at the relative stats, for every 100,000 people, the U.S. has around 700 people in jail. That makes the U.S. only second behind Seychelles, a country with 90,000 people and a U.N. prison for Somali pirates. But has this always been the case? Well, if you look at the historical incarceration levels, they remain fairly steady until... 
the 80s. Please, please. The war on drugs. Drugs are menacing our society. They're killing our children. Since the 80s, the prison population has more than quadrupled. So what caused all of this? A national explosion of crime and illegal drug use led to the passing of two seminal crime laws. In the 80s, it was the mandatory minimum sentences for drug crimes, and in the 90s, it was the three strikes laws. They essentially forced a prison sentence on every drug offender in America over the last 30 years. The Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988 made crack the only drug that triggered a mandatory minimum sentence just for possession. Get caught with more than five grams? You're going to jail for at least five years. Get caught multiple times in a state with a three strikes law? You might be going to jail for life without parole. And because of these laws, we now imprison more people on federal drug charges alone than the total federal prison population in 1980. And so while crack fueled longer prison sentences, the drug that still leads to the most arrests? Marijuana. A drug that 42% of American teens and adults have tried once in their lifetime. From 2001 to 2010, more than 8.2 million people were arrested for marijuana. In 2014, the amount of people arrested just for marijuana possession was more than the number of people arrested on all violent crimes put together. Way more. Not to mention that black people and white people use marijuana at the same rate, but nationally black people are 3.7 times more likely to be arrested for it. In Washington DC, that number is eight times. Well, how much does this all cost? Well, a lot. So, adjusted for inflation, in 1980, we spent about $17 billion on incarceration. This pile of potatoes here represents what we spent in 2010, which was $80 billion. The difference between those two is $63 billion. Well, what does $63 billion get you? Just the combined 2010 budgets for the EPA, the Department of Labor, the Department of Treasury, the National Science Foundation, and NASA. So what do you think is more important? Locking up nonviolent drug offenders for life, or protecting the planet, finding American jobs, and, and advancing the US in space exploration? All right, so the video discussed uh, a few important issues. Firstly, the ridiculous amount of people that are imprisoned in this system, the racial disparities um, that we're recognizing when we look at those statistics, the dramatic increase since the war on drugs, oppressive policies like mandatory minimums and the three strikes rule. It also highlights uh, how incarceration surprisingly doesn't actually decrease crime and also how um, expensive that system is. Before we get really into the talk uh, even further, there's one more clip that I want to show uh, the trailer for the documentary 13th by Ava DuVernay. It's a must see for anyone that is interested in these issues, focusing on how the 13th Amendment basically created a loophole for the prison system to emerge as a modern day form of slavery. Then they said, we're going to take you to the precinct and most likely we're going to let you go home and then I never went home. The 13th Amendment to the Constitution makes it unconstitutional for someone to be held as a slave. There are exceptions, including criminals. The loophole was immediately exploited. What you got after that was a rapid transition to a mythology of black criminality. Some people got the real problem. Animals, beasts that needed to be controlled. You better believe it. I'm only human. It became virtually impossible for a politician to run and appear soft on crime. The kinds of kids that are called super predators. Millions of dollars will be allocated for prison and jail facilities. Three strikes and you are out. It was an enormous burden on the black community, but it also violated a sense of core fairness. Some people got the real the states were required to keep these prisons filled, even if nobody was committing a crime. It's so difficult to talk about mass incarceration because it has become heavily monetized. I'm only human. The focus is on taking people from prison, putting them in community corrections, parole and probation. How much progress is it really if now there's a private company making money off the GPS monitor? now have more African Americans under criminal supervision than all the slaves back in the 1850s. We are the products of the history that our ancestors chose. Products of that set of choices that we have to understand in order to escape from it. We should go looking somewhere high. After all, don't put the blame on me. So 
a bulk of this conversation is going to be talking about the concept of the prison system and how it is a direct result of slavery. It is a new manifestation of slavery, what that looks like. Um, and there's a couple important statistics that really highlight how we can reframe our view of prisons to see the comparison uh, in a more stark manner. So over the period of the Atlantic slave trade, from approximately 1526 to 1867, some 12.5 million slaves had been shipped from Africa, and 10.7 million had arrived in the Americas. The volume of slaves carried off from Africa reached 30,000 per year in the 1960s and 85,000 per year a century later. Now, because I don't consider myself to be an expert on any of these things, I will be relying a lot on um, research and the words of others that know more about this than me. Um, if you want to see these statistics, please let me either contact me via Facebook, put it in the YouTube comments. I can send that information to you. But essentially, we're incarcerating nearly 30 times that amount of individuals each year in the United States, if not more, at any given time. So for context, that means that in five years of incarcerating between 1.3 million to 2.5 million individuals per year in the United States, mass incarceration will have impacted and imprisoned the equivalent number of the same number of Africans enslaved in the Americas. That's only within five years. Now, keep in mind that, unfortunately, it has been over 40 years since Ronald Reagan, shout out to him, began the war on drugs, which led a 500% increase in incarceration. 500% increase. So there's going to be those that say, but slavery is different. These people that are in jail, they deserve it. Here's why you're wrong about that. So in philosophy, uh, I'm a philosophy student here at the University of Georgia, and we always discuss is of the utmost importance to define your terms. So I think it's important to make a specific claim about how exactly these systems of the prison industrial complex and slavery are nearly identical. To do that, I'm going to rely on the comparison of a uh, conservative prison reform advocate that, uh, what is his name? John DeWar Gleisner. He wrote a book called Prison and Slavery, A Surprising Comparison. But before I get into that, I do think it is important to mention that as a conservative prison reform advocate, he also has a slew of ridiculous things to say about the prison system, its economic efficiency, and kind of romanticizing slavery. And I think he was even at one point talking about how it wasn't as bad as people thought. So don't take everything that he says. But <laughs> I think that he does a good job of kind of summing up the similarities and the overlap between the prison system and slavery. So he says, we are not accustomed to thinking of prisoners as slaves, but in all basic ways, they are state slaves. Although not strictly chattel, prisoners owe absolute obedience, have no physical freedom and little status, enjoy few rights, and remain subjugated or abused for many years, in prison and after their release. Slavery has gone from an agrarian, paternalistic, personal form of private enterprise slavery to the socialized, impersonal, institutional, mass state slavery through incarceration inside hard surfaces directed from Washington, D.C. and 50 state capitals. Now, it's important to note that both slavery and thus now the prison system are state-sponsored activities. That is what we should be up in arms about. That is um, a foundational part of this talk and why I think we all need to care about it. Uh, now, if you'll bring up the image about the number. So there are numerous statistics that reflect the vast impact of mass incarceration, is there a way, can we make, yeah. like, my face don't need to be there, just, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so there's a numerous statistics that reflect the impact of mass incarceration. So this uh, is breaking down kind of who's in state prisons, local jails, um, we're seeing 1.3 million as the statistic that we discussed earlier are in state prisons. I wanna say this is from 2015, I believe, 2017. 
630,000 individuals in local jails. And uh, this is a image that I would take the time. I'm not going to go over all of it, but it shows a lot of information if you want to take this to access later, if you're able to screenshot it. Again, if you want to ask uh, me to send you the image as well so you can review it. But a few things that I want to highlight is that the number of African Americans incarcerated right now, so with this total pie chart, it adds up to about 2.3 million individuals. That is equal to one half of the entire antebellum male slave population in 1860. Furthermore, African Americans in the modern US correctional population, so not including the entire uh, prison population, including those on probation and those uh, being surveilled, so on a, some sort of like parole system, exceed the number of American slaves in 1850. So we're talking about an issue that is impacting more people today than those that were impacted through slavery. Now, of course, that is no way to minimize, oh, well, maybe slavery wasn't that bad. No, it, that's the point. <laughs> it was still terrible, and we're doing worse. <laughs> so uh, aside from the human lives impacted, it is important to conceptualize what that means in the context of both prison conditions as well as the financial gain for corporations, which is where the title of this show comes from. Let's talk about Whole Foods, but we'll get to that. So first I'm gonna start out discussing prison conditions. Um, when establishing how I wanted to kind of frame this show because it is such a large topic and kind of, it, it includes a lot of different nuanced um, bits of information. So I was reading Angela Davis's If They Come in the Morning, a compilation of writing from radicals such as the, uh, some Black Panthers, George Jackson, Huey P. Newton, Bobby Seale, and Erica Huggins. The introduction is written by James Baldwin. The book not only provides primary source accounts of Angela Davis's incarceration experience, but also the experience of other radicals that were targeted during this time. The goal of the book is essentially to frame prison specifically as a weapon of fascism, as highlight how many um, incarcerated individuals are actually political prisoners. Not criminals, political prisoners. There is a difference. So I won't be doing an in-depth analysis of the book on the show, but I would recommend that uh, you pick up the book if you're interested in organizing around these issues. So specifically, I would like to focus on the analysis of prison conditions as detailed in the Folsom Prisoners Manifesto of Demands and anti-oppression platform that is provided in the book. So the inmates within Folsom Prison in California broke it down like this. The program we are committed to under this ridiculous title of rehabilitation is likened to the ancient stupidity of pouring water on a drowning man. And as much as our, as our program administrators respond to our hostilities with their own, and our efforts to comprehend on a feeling level of an existence contrary to violence, we are confronted by our captors with violence. And our effort to comprehend society society's code of ethics concerning what is fair and just, we are victimized by exploitation and the denial of the celebrated due process of the law. I think that it raises a very important question, how can we expect people to be rehabilitated when they are facing, are facing an experience, a, uh, an environment, and surroundings that are at least as hostile, if not more hostile, than the environments that they came from prior to this. So at this time, I would like to discuss a tour of the Athens jail that I took in, I wanna say, that might have been last month, the month prior to, um, as I was getting prepared for some work that I would like to do in this issue, there was a few things that stood out to me in particular, um, specifically the outdoor, out, we're using the term outdoor very loosely here for what they have in the jail. So essentially it's about a uh, space this size of the room that we're in, so in any bedroom size space. Uh, the bottom is concrete, it is not grass, there's no trees, there's no semblance of the outdoors. The outdoor portion is just a grate that is put on the ceiling. So I guess you can get the sunlight, but the way the buildings are set up, really the sun is coming to like a far corner of the room because you know the sun isn't just directly over the jail, which I'm sure they know. Um, so they're not actually getting that opportunity to receive vitamin D, to get out 
in the sun, the things that human beings need to function and for your body to work are not actually being provided for them. Uh, aside from that, the food options for those with and without dietary restrictions are extremely subpar. Um, I'm mentioning the dietary restrictions really just to kind of give them the benefit of the doubt. But quite frankly, I think even those without dietary restrictions should still have access to vegetables, um, fruit, things with nutritional value. Uh, believe it or not, candy, chips, and ramen is not really the foundation of a healthy diet. That's not going to uh, feed your brain. That's not going to nourish your body. It's not going to help your mental health in any way. And we have seen numerous statistics on uh, kind of the overlap between mental health issues and people ending up in incarcerated periods. So we know that's there. None of that is being addressed by both the lack of sunlight exposure and thus also the lack of uh, proper nutrition. Then they also have a new visitation system. Theoretically, I guess we could say this is some sort of industrial revolution in the jail. They are becoming more technologically advanced. Uh, but in doing that, you don't actually get to visit with your family member. You're going to a room with all the other family members that are visiting their prisoners, uh, or their, their family, I'm sorry. And sitting in this room, looking at a computer screen that I guess has like a Skype capability, and the inmates are still in their unit with a computer, Skyping in, basically. There is no, you don't get your subpar 10 second hug that you used to be able to get. You can't have a quick like kiss on the cheek with a loved one, no. You're not getting any sort of physical contact from the people that actually care about you because instead they think that I guess this is eliminating contraband because no one can come into the jail really with anything to visit anyone. So um, that to me really stood out because in isolation, I think still all of these things are unacceptable. But when you're compounding the fact that you're not getting any sort of human connection, you can't see the people that you love, you can't nourish your body with healthy foods, and you also aren't getting access to sunlight. These are basic human needs that we're claiming that at least they're supposed to be giving the bare minimum, so we say, in the jail. But we see now that this is truly not the case. Uh, additionally, the subpar reading system that they have, in each unit they have um, their own kind of little library. I don't think I saw more than maybe 20 books on any of the shelves, and it wasn't like it was something that is going to be reading that's going to help you when you get out. Maybe something to help you build a trade, some sort of skill set related reading, no, just what I'm assuming is whatever maybe the prison employees didn't feel like taking to Goodwill and decided to bring with them to work. We, I, I'm hoping that there's something that we can do about that. I'll get to that later when uh, we're discussing kind of how we get involved. But I also believe that we need to be holding the prison system accountable um, at a local level. We need to be holding the Athens jail accountable for not providing any sort of literature to these inmates. And lastly, aside from how the prison is impacting the inmates, I did also notice kind of how the employees were being treated and what, not necessarily that they were being treated with any hostility, but just kind of what their working conditions are. If I'm not mistaken, no matter what your position is, every shift is 12 hours long. I can't see the difference, but maybe someone can explain it to me in the comments or in the audience. If I go to work in the jail and they have this new direct supervision model, so as someone that is actually working in the jail, you would be directly supervising in the unit. So that means that you would be staying in the unit for your 12 hours. What is the difference between that and being an inmate yourself, as far as I'm concerned? If you are, you have to eat the food if you did not bring your lunch, you are in the jail for your 12 hours a day, you're not getting your sunlight either, you're not getting outside contact with other humans, and you're also there isolated by yourself in this situation where you have those strange power dynamics. It's not like anything about this job I can imagine is in any way fulfilling for these individuals. Um, they also have a control center inside the jail. So that's where 
when people are coming in through the gates or trying to access a door, that's uh, basically these are going to be the people that let you in. So we go into there. It's completely dark. It's two people sitting at a desk kind of this size, surrounded by computers. The room is black. <laughs> there is no light, okay? But on top of that, they're listening to these never-ending dings to open the door. So it'll be like, Someone's at the gate, ding, ding. And then they have a different, ding. It's like the other one is just like all types of different types of dinging going around for 12 hours at a time. Like I just, I really, in the two minutes, I was like, can we please get out of here? Like this, this is not okay. And so I asked them, I was like, okay, well, if your shift is 12 hours, you know, what happens if, like, do you get a lunch break? How does that work? So then he explains that, if you didn't bring your own lunch, which would be preferable, and say you ordered out, the person, someone is going to bring it to you. You don't even get to stretch your legs and go get it. Like, it's really a come in, come out. If you're going to the bathroom, there needs to be someone there to cover you. Like, you are expected to sit in this dark room listening to ding, 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 ding all day. And that, that, to me, I just, I can't, I don't understand it. But I think this is an important time to say that I'm more concerned about the inmates <laughs> than the work conditions. But I also think it is worth noting that they are working in poor conditions as well. Which probably does not make them fun to work, interact with. Exactly, exactly. Because as far as I'm concerned, if you are staying in this kind of secluded situation in a, a prison already it's like that is not you're going to be more on edge you're not going to be at your best especially working 12 hour long shifts I guess four times a week like that is not the type of people that need to be working in this rehabilitative system if that's what we're claiming so at this point really what I'm trying to aim to do here is have a call to action for all of us to get involved, do what we can on the large spectrum of whatever it is that you identify with in these issues. Firstly, if you get nothing else out of this talk, I want to make it clear that supporting prisons, supporting prisons is supporting modern day slavery. There is no distinction there is nothing about people deserving this. They don't deserve to be treated like subhuman. If you can't eat food to nourish you, you can't interact with other human beings and receive any sort of love, care, and compassion. All you're getting is hostility around the clock. You can't go outside. You can't see that the sun is not touching your flesh. This is not how human beings are treated and we're allegedly what this is the free world, the freest country in the world. That is not the case here. Corporations are also making ridiculous amounts of money off of this system, whether it be privatized phone calling, uh, privatized sending money from uh, like a family member sending money to an inmate. Just the other day, personally, I was trying to just send my brother some money for Christmas. $20. I was like, let me just send $20. The fee was $7 to send $20. And I was just really trying to figure out, like, what is this that their system, everywhere else I could send money, most places you could send money almost for free. But for some reason, I have to also pay the price of almost 50% fees to send $20 to someone on Christmas. We can't even get a special for the holidays. <laughs> like, I, I just, I, that really, like, blew my mind, quite frankly. But I want to take this time, I'm sure all of you are wondering what the title Let's Talk About Whole Foods has to do with this. Let me tell you, I bet you will never go get your kale from Whole Foods again. Because, <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm giving you too much credit. We, or it's probably there will be people still going. But I want to say they received their produce from, yes, Colorado prisons until April of, I believe it was 2015, that something came out that really what happened was Orange is the New Black actually ex casually mentioned that Whole Foods had prison labor. And I think at that time, they sent out something saying they would plan to stop using uh, prison labor. So I, it's really a, was a struggle for me to figure out if that ever came to be. Um, I feel like if it did, there would have been something saying like, this is the day we have no longer are using prison labor, but I couldn't find that information. So they may or may not still be using it. 
However, I don't want to get my vegetables from anyone that ever thought that using prison labor was okay. Uh, there, I have found a list on this website was Caged Bird Magazine. It was uh, about 50 corporations that rely on prison labor. So I'm just going to name a few here. McDonald's, Walmart, Victoria's Secret. Now, I just really want to take a moment <laughs> like, to talk about Victoria's Secret having the utmost nerve <laughs> to sell a bra for $50 that they paid someone maybe 50 cents to make like i interesting okay <laughs> at&t we've got bp british petroleum uh caterpillar <laughs> if you live in athens you know why i looked at you <laughs> uh costco we've got john deere exxon kmart I mean, the Coke Industries, but who's surprised? Uh, Microsoft, Motorola, Nintendo, Pepsi. Like, these are things that we... And no, nope, because Motorola is Google. <laughs> Dang. Yeah, that's even where you... Really, we need to break it down to see where these corporate... That, that, that would be a whole other show on that, honestly. Starbucks is... Starbucks, ladies. <laughs> Starbucks. <laughs> no, yeah, that pumpkin spice latte... Uh -huh. Adding pumpkin spice latte to racism did not make it worse. Honestly. <laughs> so it's like these are things that we need to know. These are things that we need to keep up on because we are contributing to these systems at that point. They are, we are supporting them with our dollar. And that is something that, though it's not going to be the sole way that we can end any of this, I'm not saying if you just stop shopping at Whole Foods and Starbucks and all these places that that will be it, but this is a step. This is a way that you can make your statement. This is a way that you can make it clear that you do not support corporations profiting off prison labor. Now, I know not all of us are ready to call ourselves prison abolitionists and kind of go out on that complete radical shift overnight. So kind of my suggestions here are going to be ranging and how far do you want to get involved? If you want to stop it, just I would start, stop, look up some recipe, or recipes, recipes, <laughs> look up some recipes so you can cook at home so you don't have to go. <laughs> To frequent McDonald's, okay? Uh, no, but look up these lists. Look up and see who is benefiting from these things and make sure that you are not supporting them. That is a good starting point. Additionally, there are some reform measures. Yes? Someone has pointed out that uh, they spent time in a federal prison where they made military uniforms for a corporation and then sold them back to the government. Oh, okay. what? Wait, so are you... So wait, so the, <laughs> so the corporation... Was uh, explain? Will you say that again? Uh, the gentleman explains. I was in federal prison, mm -hmm. and they made military uniforms and for a corporation that sold those uniforms to the government. I just wanted to make sure I heard that properly. So the United States government, <laughs> surprisingly, is benefiting from prison labor. Don't support the United <laughs> States government either. I guess that's where we're at. Shout out to you, sir. Thank you for sharing that information. Except they're actually not probably benefiting because they're paying a markup. Yeah. <laughs> but not enough. Not enough. I need them to pay more. <laughs> um, so on t there was actually, that brings me to one of the businesses, they actually had some inmates that spoke out about the fact um, that they were make, basically making 25 cents a day uh, using, oh, I'll have to... Yeah, what a shame. Yeah, I'll post it later. It was a very interesting story. These two inmates essentially were then penalized. for. I don't really know how you further penalize someone that's already in prison, but I'm assuming maybe solitary confinement or something like that um, for actually coming out and saying that we are doing this work and no one is paying us for it. So it's not like this is the first time that this information has come out. This has been going on for a while. I know it's hard to kind of believe we don't want to accept these realities, but until we do, we can't actually make any progress. The print? Wait, what? Wash, uh, washing cars at the state patrol office, as a matter of fact, is done by prisoners. Really? Yes. Uh, 
Are they still doing the, what is it, the prisons do the fire, what is it? Where, or are they doing bio, volunteer? Yeah. Yeah, they did all, all sorts of things like that. I know multiple, um, not just in Georgia, though we are trash, but also other states. I believe California has uh, their prisoners doing volunteer firefighting, whatever that There's looks like. job they don't qualify for once they get out. A very important thing to know. So you could put your life on the line for free, but once you get out, don't think that your experience means anything. So for those of you that are interested in reform, step one, go to jail. I would recommend you do so voluntarily, like I did on a tour. Do not go out and get arrested <laughs> just so you can go and see what's going on in the jail. Like We could do this more from the outside with just kind of a request. I reached out to the jail commander, um, and they made it abundantly clear that anyone can do this. If you want to, really just email them, and they will set up a day at any time. So take a tour in the jail in your area. Critically think about what it is that you're seeing there, what sorts of things you wish they had there. Uh, I will praise the Athens jail for brief, a little, I will praise <laughs> them a little bit for having an abundance of good resources for the prisoners. They had um, a nice kind of group therapy for people to discuss their crimes openly that they sign on to say that they kind of want to experience this and free themselves of the experience that way through uh, communion with others essentially they had some good art programs for mental health treatment um, some career readiness programs GED programs things like that however where the praise ends is the fact that really those resources should just be in place before you get to jail like, really, we should just have art in the schools. We should just have people being able to get these resources before they have to get them behind bars. So just find something, anything that pisses you off or disgusts you when you go into the jail, because ultimately something will. And tell everyone that you can about it. You see, it worked. I was so mad. I had to talk, tell Irony that I was like, you got to put me on the show because this is out of control. Like, but just find something. Awareness is important. Um, the more people are angry about the same things, the more likely we are to hype each other up and get things rolling. As soon as the conversation starts, someone is going to make a suggestion. Even just today in talking about this show, uh, someone brought up the concept that they wanted to do kind of like a poetry initiative in the jail, having like a poetry workshops and so they could share their poetry. Great ideas of things that in the meantime, on the way to abolition, on the way, not at the end there. We're not going to only try to build up the resources that they have. We can't stop there. But awareness is powerful. I also read an article today about prisons in New York that are now... Uh, the inmates cannot get donated books. They have to purchase yeah. the books from vendors at like not a discounted price. Yeah, from only six. So that's part of, I just saw that too. And yeah. It affects also fresh produce. Talking about food, mm. it affects both books and produce. So they're trying to force people to buy from only six companies again so yeah, at markup families, price. Yeah, families can no longer bring them fresh produce and so forth. They have to go through the vendors. Uh, and uh, back to people. New Jersey banned uh, the new Jim Crow in their jails. They and banned the, the book? The oh, book, yeah, yeah, the book. And the judge just overturned that. Thankfully. Thankfully. But because I'm sure the New York vendors don't offer it. I'm, I'm <laughs> sure they don't. I'm sure they don't. It's more like uh, how you can make capitalism work for you. Or something. <laughs> I'm sure that's what they have in there. Uh, so, you know, that's... That just made me think, before that happens in Athens or in a city near wherever you are at home, donate some books and not the books that you just don't want to read. Get a good book, read it, and then take it to the jail. Conscious books, not something that is mindless and not going to benefit them in any way. Get a pen pal even. Write to someone that is behind bars. Let them know that there are people out here that recognize that they are being mistreated. We recognize that their humanity is being denied and we are there for them. They need to know that because as we try to continue pushing them further and further away to the outskirts of our community, as though no one cares about them, that is part of the system functioning in itself. The less that we engage with those people, the less that we know about what's going on there, it just continues to disintegrate. So we have got to stop here. 
for people in Athens specifically, did you have something you wanted? Okay. For people in Athens specifically, uh, shameless plug here, the Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement local chapter is starting an end the school to prison pipeline campaign that's launching this year. If you're interested in getting involved, they have mentoring programs, raising awareness, doing workshops. If you want to get involved in any aspect of that, you can sign up at aadmovement.org. That is aadmovement.org. They will send you any and all information that you need. You can also reach out to me on Facebook, Mocha Johnson. Uh, Yolanda Parker specifically is the contact for that program. She works with both uh, the Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement and Athens for Everyone if you would like to reach out to her in that capacity. Additionally, uh, I have worked with my co-president, M. Ilbert, on uh, the school chapter of the Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement. We're starting an inmate focus group project to interview inmates in the jail and essentially see kind of their feedback because who would know more about the school to prison pipeline than people that have experienced it themselves. So at that point, you're able to uh, kind of get what their feel was lacking in the community. Were there resources that specifically they think could have kind of prevented things from getting to this point. I don't want, and I don't suggest anyone just go out and start prescribing solutions about things that we don't really understand. It's like the first step to any change, we have got to ask people, what do you need from me? What can I do for you? And kind of building that relationship there. So if you would be interested in getting involved in that program, reach out to me as well. You can contact me via email at ias68234 at uga.edu. Disregard the fact that my UGA email sounds like an inmate number. I do all the time. It's <laughs> very strange, but that is the email. ias68234 at uga.edu. Now, lastly, for those of us interested in radical systemic change, I would encourage you to, first of all, pick up Angela Davis's book, If They Come in the Morning, Voices of Resistance. It was an excellent book. It does a great job of kind of laying out a blueprint for what this sort of revolutionary process for prison abolition will look like. And just some easy, well, none of it is easy, but easily understood uh, suggestions, things that you can start approaching other people with. Because at first, glance it just it sounds crazy what do you mean you want to get rid of the prisons like where are these people going to go my response to that at all times is that was the same question that people were asking when they wanted to abolish slavery what are we going to do with all of these slaves where are they going to go unfortunately the answer was prisons we have to come up with a real answer for that at this point in time um so the book i would definitely recommend you start there uh, specifically within the book, they have the Folsom Prisoners Manifesto of Demands. Uh, that is an excellent starting point for specific issues to raise awareness and to rally people behind those issues. We don't have to have a meeting as far as what, uh, what are we going to do? Where should we start? They have been talking about these issues since the 70s. The steps are there. The manifesto is there. The demands are there. And uh, unfortunately, we haven't progressed enough for it to not still be relevant. <laughs> so we can literally use the same thing as a framework to continue our work here today. So I'd like to end with a quote from the book. Uh, I believe, yeah, this was in Angela Davis's portion herself. So the book is broken up into both what Angela Davis is saying and then specific uh, essays written by others as well. So the, in her words, if we begin to grapple with some of these developments, if we begin to see the relationship between the prison system and fascist ideology and program, if we begin to see that we must develop our concept of the political prisoner, and if we begin to see the relationship between containment and home, containment at home and counterinsurgency and aggression abroad, then we will have opened up whole new avenues for legal and political events and involving many thousands of people. I really am not sure that we will be dissenting and organizing effectively as long as we are working within the bounds of the law. With that being the case, we need to prepare for our fellow activists and ourselves to potentially be jailed. I'm not just telling this to you. I personally, I've started doing my yoga, preparing my meditation in case I ever have to be anywhere for a long time where I could just have me in here. 
I'm not joking when I say that. These are things that we need to be considering because Irony said something uh, very powerful on the show a couple of weeks ago. Jail is just something that good people go through sometimes. If we're going to fight these systems, we might have to go through that and we need to be prepared for the ramifications of what that looks like. So let me be clear, though. I'm not saying go riot the streets and break into jails and free the inmates today. I'm also not saying not to do that. If you want to do that, I'm not saying don't. But what I am saying is we have to prepare for that time. We have to organize seriously. We have to take this work seriously and have the something to fall back on. We need bail funds. We need legal counsel that is there and people that are ready to mobilize if something does happen. We need to know how people's children are going to be cared for or if children in the community if something goes wrong with someone's parents. We need strong support systems committed to standing with any and all of our fellow activists who are jailed and we must follow through with the support when the time comes. Don't y'all just let me go to jail now. Nobody is going to jail by themselves, okay? If I find out that you were in jail, write me before you do anything. Please let me know. <laughs> Make sure other people know. Don't just go out rioting or whatever you want to do. Make sure you have contacted the bail fund. You have someone ready to get you out beforehand. These are the types of things that we need to think about if we want to take this movement seriously. So I'd say it's about time to go ahead and wrap this up. So let's just go over the main points that we have discussed here today. The most important thing, the prison system is a modern day form of slavery. And as such, we have to abolish it. Anyone in prison because of unjust or discriminatory laws is a political prisoner. They are not a criminal and there is a difference. These people deserve our support. They must be freed. And what the Folsom Prisoner Manifesto refers to as fascist concentration camps in modern America must be abolished. It is imperative that we all get involved in our jails and hold them accountable for injustices as well as provide supplementary resources to prevent incarceration in our communities. So that is all I've got. I would like to open up the floor now in case anyone has a question. Uh, well, before I open up the floor to ask uh, questions and commentary, uh, this is the time that we want to go ahead and shout out Richard Winfield for Congress. His campaign launching event is going to be on January 13th. That was tomorrow at 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. This is at the East Athens Educational Dance Center at uh, 390 McKinley Drive, Athens, Georgia, 30601. Uh, this man is honestly one of the most radical politicians I think I have ever encountered in my lifetime. Uh, his social bill of rights program, I think is something that everyone needs to read and recognize that there is a man out here that legitimately said these words aloud and is planning on doing something with them seriously. We need to take him seriously. So please check him out tomorrow at 3 p.m. if you can. All right. So does anyone have any questions or comments at this time? or disputes or anything. I have a question about the Athens jail. Mm -hmm. um, did you, were you able to uh, find out or they tell you or do you know what percentage of the people that are actually in the jail there are, have been convicted mm. versus are awaiting trial? No, I don't think they would have told me that, honestly. <laughs> I, I'm sure we could find that information and that is something that I'd be interested in seeing as well. Um, it Actually, might think that most of the people there haven't been convicted. That I think is the case in most jails, unfortunately, that most people have not been convicted right. of a the crime. Jail is where they're kept before the trial. Right. If they're convicted, then they go to prison. Then they go exactly. To to yeah, that is something, that is a so, very valid point. So all these people that you're talking about that don't get to go outside, they are in our, in our legal system. They're supposed to be still considered... Innocent. Innocent. Right. They haven't been proven guilty. Right. They've been arrested. They haven't been proven guilty. They have a right to a trial. And yet they're, you know, can't even touch their... Exactly. Life. Can't even see their loved ones or get sunlight. It, uh, it, actually, that now that you brought that up, that reminds me of something that was brought to my attention today. I want to say this was in... This is in New York, that they have people going into the jail and... Uh, 
distributing voter registration. Um, they were discussing, I just really briefly watched the clip before I came here, but um, essentially the person that was speaking about it was saying that these people, exactly what you're saying, not all of them have been convicted of a crime. If there is an election coming up, there is absolutely no reason why they shouldn't have their right to vote. Um, and as such, I think that is also something that we should be considering here in the Athens jail because I don't think that is taking place or in other cities that is something worth considering. And I think that that knowledge of the fact that people that are in jail haven't always been convicted already, they are just awaiting trial, that kind of adds on a bit more um, ammo when we're kind of discussing this with people that are like, well, wait, no, they're criminals. It's like, no, no, no. People are innocent until proven guilty, and not all of these people have been proven guilty. And whether they'll go to or not is really aside the point. They still <laughs> deserve to be treated like humans. Any, anybody else have anything they would like to say? Well, thank you all for watching. I hope Irony <laughs> I hope we did you justice here today. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Shout out to you, Ashley. Thank you.